Alrighty. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the fourth, I believe, installment of our Natural History series, where we talk about the history of life on this planet, as well as some geology and climatology. And joining me, as per usual, is the Dapper Dinosaur. Hello. Hello, Hello everybody. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I am, once again, Jackson Wheat's most frequent guest, I think total... And I also right. his most frequent guest who is not in the opening credits. As as the creator oh, of the man. opening oh, credits, and... I, I can I can say <laughs> that the, everyone in the opening credits is on camera. So if you send me some, some footage, I, I shall I'm on camera you. right now. I mean he he's on camera. He's a dinosaur. That's him right there. That's I me. can see him. Uh, I'm, um, I'm skeptical. And uh, also, he looks pretty real to me. Jackson, I have good news. <laughs> Or maybe bad news, yes. depending on how you look at it. Uh, okay, last time enough. you said, I, I think you have more subscribers than me. And I did not, but I do now. Woo! So, there you go. Very nice. Very nice. I guess I this channel is yours now? Yep, your, I own it. Your, what, your third channel? So. Um. Well, okay. There are some channels that people don't know about that are technically owned by me. So, I think this would actually be my sixth channel. Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, but only two of them ever actually get updates. Okay, fair enough, I guess. Because there are like I know other it's... channels that technically exist. I only use them to watch uh, YouTube in places where I don't want it to affect my like Dapper Dino like search results. Oh, okay, yeah. I gotcha. Because uh, I know about um, you know obviously this one and then the uh, the one where you do like games and stuff, right? Yeah, I have Top Hats Off, uh, which right. is off topic. So there's art stuff there. There's game stuff. Um, that's where I do my uh, my Power Rangers RPG Let's Play. That's... Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. Wednesday. It's coming up. Um, yeah. But yeah, then I have Dapper Dino. And then I have other channels that, like I said, just exist. So that when I, um, say, decide to watch like a whole bunch of like uh, anti-vax nonsense to see if I want to cover any of it, it mm. doesn't then come up in my main YouTube like feeds. Right. Yeah, no, I hate watching a creationist video because like someone sent it to me. And then I'll have five recommended creationist videos. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I don't want to watch any of these. Get yeah, them that's, out. <laughs> get a separate YouTube account that's just for that. It's yeah. like your burner account, right? It's just for tanking all of your recommended videos. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. At any rate. Is, uh, is, is this like the part where I start ex explaining <laughs> incognito tabs? No, see, the thing is, just on those other channels, I want the bad recommendations. Because yeah. then I can go to them, and that'll help me research. Oh, right. Okay. So I want those recommendations on some contexts, but not just my general browsing YouTube. Right. Okay. Right, that's fair. Um, all right. Well, um, we were in the Mesozoic last time. This is part two of the Mesozoic. And so... To the Triassic, we shall return. Are you ready, Daphne? Well, I mean, have at it. there's an Aedosaur, so I'm absolutely ready. I'm ready. Okay, so, Pseudosuchia. Oh, it's actually a good idea to start with Pseudosuchia when we're in the Triassic, because while the Mesozoic is thought of as the time of the dinosaurs, broadly speaking, the Triassic is really the time of the Pseudosuchians. Pseudosuchia is the group of archosaurs that are closer to crocodilians than they are to dinosaurs, including crocodilians. Uh, so, a lot of the things that are Pseudosuchians in the Triassic, you might actually mistake for a dinosaur. So, for instance, if you look at Poposaurus, really, for most people, the only indication that this isn't a dinosaur that you're going to get is that it has uh, a plantigrade feet, sort of like a bear or a human, as opposed to digitigrade, like a dinosaur or a dog. So, um, but we also have things like Rudiodon, which is taking on what we now think of as the crocodilian role, even though it's not terribly closely related to crocodilians. Um, Aedosaurs were taking on sort of the Ankylosaurus or Glyptodont niche back before it was cool. Or actually, perhaps they're the ones who made it cool. But um, there were these pig-snouted crocodile-lying um, plant eaters. 
really cool. There were actually a whole bunch of other um, Pseudosukians. I don't remember if we get to it in the next slide, but there's like a whole fauna of Pseudosukians that superficially look like later dinosaurs. Like uh, there are Pseudosukians that look like Ornithomimid dinosaurs, like Ornithomimus or Gallimimus. There were Pseudosukians that looked like big theropods, like, you know, Poposaurus and things like that. So very interesting group. Um, they don't ever really go away as far as like significant portions of the land fauna, but they do end up getting restricted to um, fewer niches than they had earlier in the Triassic. But still, there were a lot of uh, terrestrial and aquatic and semi-aquatic and even marine uh, Pseudosuchians all through the Mesozoic. So it's an important line and they don't really get enough attention because dinosaurs kind of steal the limelight. But there you go. And I think unless Jackson has anything, we are ready to go on. Sounds good to me. Ah, uh, yes. So Ornithodira, and we're talking here about the non-dinosaur Ornithodirans. So Ornithodira is the group of animals basically that is closer to dinosaurs than it is to um, crocodilians. So it's the opposite side of Pseudosuchia. Now, for most of the Mesozoic, the only Ornithodirans you're going to come across are dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Basically, everything else is more or less gone. But during the uh, Triassic, we have a whole bunch of Ornithodirans that are either somewhat closer to pterosaurs or somewhat closer to um, dinosaurs. And I do like that Lagerpaton is here because even though it's very hard to tell the difference between Lagerpaton and Marasuchus and Silosaurus, it's actually closer to pterosaurs like Bramphorhynchus than it is to dinosaurs which is uh, Marasuchus and Silosaurus are both dinosaur morphs. And so <clears throat> it really does take an expert to notice that these things aren't dinosaurs. You have to look at things like details of the hip anatomy, um, uh, various way that, you know, various processes and things like that on the skull work. It's, it takes, I don't know that I could reliably do it, even with a very well-preserved skeleton. It's very difficult to tell the difference in some of these cases. And one of the things that, that I want to highlight with that is, these are all basal ornithodirans, right? Later on in the Mesozoic, we get more derived dinosaurs and um, pterosaurs. But look, at the base of Ornithodira, you get a bunch of animals that look very similar, which is what we would expect if, in fact, common ancestry for this group is true. We would expect Whoa. the oldest forms would look very similar to each other, even though later forms looked very distinct. Crazy stuff. Yeah, so Ornithodira is another one of these Nice little examples like um, like Afrotheres with Pezosiren and Moetherium and things like that, which I'm sure we'll get to in the Cenozoic. Um, that yeah, this is this common theme throughout evolutionary history. Early forms resemble each other closely because they are literally more closely related. Which I think is all I have on non-dinosaurian Ornithodirans. If you want to know about the, the big difference anatomically between Ornithodirans and Pseudosuchians, check the previous episode because we did go over it back then. I don't want to rehash it now. There were a couple of, uh, so these guys are all fairly uh, small bodied. Uh, of course, pterosaurs get you know, bigger later on, as we'll see. Uh, but there there were a couple non-dinosaur ornithodirons that got fairly large, like a Telia crater was one of them, but most of them were fairly small. Yeah. Like, like a Marasuchus is, what is it, like the rabbit crocodile, isn't that what it is? Um, is that that one? Is, I'm trying to think if that's what that means. I think no, that's, means, no, that's... But... Uh, Lagosuchus, sorry, that's Lagosuchus. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, because they're it's like the size of a rabbit. You know? <laughs> they're pretty small. Oh yeah, um, little guys. Oh, it, f fun thing. Even though "sukus" means uh, crocodile in Greek, and it's usually used on Pseudosuchians, uh, it's not always the case. You will get things used with in that. Uh, you will get animals with that element in their name that are ornithodirans and things like that. So. You got to be kind of careful with just guessing about the actual ancestry of an animal based on its name. Sometimes it can be a good hint, not always. Most famously, Basilosaurus, which sounds like a dinosaur, but is in fact a whale. So, yep. I think I'm good. Are you? I think that's good. That's a uh, yeah. Sounds so, good. All right. All right. I think you covered that quite well. Thank you. All right, early dinosaurs. Okay, so 
once again, we get to animals that still look a lot like the previous animals we saw, because the earliest dinosaurs are barely distinguishable from the later dinosaur morphs. And so we have Coelophysis, which is one of our first... Um, it's one of the first animals that really looks like what we typically think of as a theropod, which are sort of the, the two-legged, primarily meat-eating uh, dinosaurs like T-Rex or Allosaurus. Coelophysis is relatively small, as you can see there. It's only about a meter tall. Um, there has been some suggestion that Coelophysis was a cannibal. However, the evidence that that was based on turns out not to have been very indicative of cannibalistic behavior. However, I will also say that cannibalism is extremely common. So while that evidence did not actually support cannibalism, the idea that there was cannibalism going on in Coelophysis is extremely uninterest, like not uninteresting, but um, extremely not extraordinary, like very, very likely, because that's true for most animals that are at least meat eaters. Um, we have Pisanosaurus. Pisanosaurus is neat because, like it says there, early Ornithischia. So the early history of Ornithischia is actually really hard to trace. Um, no one really knows exactly why this is, but the earliest Ornithischians seem to just kind of pop up as Ornithischians, and we don't have a great fossil record for the morphological changes from, you know, basal dinosaurs to actual Ornithischians. And, um, yeah, it's pretty unfortunate, and this is one of our first ones, but already it's sort of looking like Herrerasaurus, which itself is one of the more basally branching um, Ornithischians. Uh, so we have Buriolustes. Now, one of the interesting things you can see about Buriolustes is it looks a whole lot like Coelophysis, even though it's a sauropodomorph, which means that it's part of the same lineage as, say, like Brachiosaurus, right? Well, the reason for that is that those two lineages at this point are only recently uh, diverged from each other. And the sauropodomorphs are still looking very much like their Sauruskian brethren in the theropods. And we also have Herrerasaurus. Herrerasaurus might be one of the hardest to place dinosaurs in like the history of dinosaurs. There are some people who put it as uh, basally branching to both uh, sauropodomorpha as well as theropoda. So it's actually I don't think this is likely. I, I don't think this is the case, but it's possible that this is actually about as basal a dinosaur as we've ever discovered in terms of just actual ancestry. Like this might be very close to the first dinosaur. Um, and there are debates as to whether or not it falls on the theropod or the sauropodomorph line. Um, I am a little bit of a traditionalist when it comes to Herosaurus classification. I tend to think of it as a theropod, although I will not... Uh, pick a fight over it. If you decide that you think that it's much more likely a uh, sauropodomorph, uh, hey, you have fun with that. I'm not gonna. I don't have great arguments against that position. I think the the uh, sauropodomorph position was promoted in the uh, the newer dinosaur phylogeny. It right? was. Uh, was it Lee at all? I don't honestly remember their names. Um, but it but yeah, it was the one that came out in like 2019, something like that. Yeah. So the new 2018 somewhere. The new dinosaur um, phylogeny idea involves the idea that uh, basically uh, sauropods are essentially not dinosaurs. And instead, uh, dinosauria, which is then referred to as ornithoskeleta because people, uh, people are horrible. I hate people. That's why. It's because someone decided that we didn't want to redef we didn't want to change which animals were dinosaurs. We would rather just redefine the taxon. That's why that happened. Anyway, um, don't want to get too far into that. Uh, yeah, that did recover uh, Herosaurus as being a sauropodomorph and not technically a dinosaur. But right now, that hypothesis is not terribly well supported. So I don't want to get too far into it because that might get confusing. So I'm ready. Yes, I agree. Sounds good. Uh, I didn't include uh, Eoraptor, which is another, like, super basal dinosaur on here. How dare you, sir? So. I know. I can only put so many uh, theropods and, you know, possible theropods on one slide. At this point, they're all possible theropods, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Buriolestes is certainly a, a strange one. Like, it eats meat, but 
It's a sauropodomorph. Ha ha. Take that, your basic understanding of dinosaur, I don't know, like ecology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're ready to go on to the next one. All right. Sauropodomorpha, which we already got one of. So sauropodomorpha, like I was talking about earlier, is the group of things that are like sauropods, hence the name. Sauropods are what you think of as the long neck dinosaurs. And <clears throat> so before we actually get like you sauropods, if you will, we have this group of animals in the Triassic that are all kind of sauropod-ish. And they start actually getting pretty big towards the end of the Triassic, like Platyosaurus, which I believe was, was that in the Radian stage? Jackson, do you remember? In which stage? The oh, oh, in, oh, the 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 very last one. That's possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the dinosaurs from the Triassic are like mid to late, so that that's entirely possible. Yeah, I think they start in like the Norian stage. Yeah, it's yeah, so possibly. Yeah. So yeah, we're in that kind of realm here. So um, basically, these are some of the first really significant. Um, herbivorous dinosaurs that make a big impact on their ecosystems. Up until this point, dinosaurs have been small, relatively insignificant, but here at the end of the Triassic, you're starting to see them take <clears throat> uh, much bigger roles in the ecosystem. And in fact, they're starting to become the dominant animals that eventually they will be, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the Mesozoic. So, but um, I think... I mean, unless we have anything in particular to talk about with Platyosaurus or Pantydraco or Melanosaurus, I, I'm okay with going on. Yeah, not really. I was just showing that, like, you have your smaller forms, you know, like Briolestes, which is like super basal, and then sort of your your smaller sauropodomorphs, and then getting larger until you. It looks pretty much like a, you know, a lot like the later true sauropods. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sauropodomorpha, I can barely read this. But um my apologies. <clears throat> uh, so here we have the yeah, this evolution of gigantism. So one of the things that you have is basically this is more or less arranged from top to bottom, from smaller to larger. And one of the things that's interesting is that with a few exceptions you don't actually, you, you can actually kind of do that, um, which is interesting. Like L, which is one of the farthest down ones, is Titanosauria, which is where you get some of the largest land animals that have ever lived, including the largest land animals that have ever lived to our knowledge. Um, so unless someone comes up with a brand new fossil, things like uh, Titanosaurus are going to remain our, some of our biggest land animals that we know of. And so this is a really strong amount of directional selection for an extremely long period. Cause you're going to remember this is going basically from the late Triassic up into like the early Cretaceous, basically. Now I say early Cretaceous, there were Titanosaurs in the late Cretaceous, but um, it's a little bit harder to say exactly if there was still like a big size increase because there, uh, there are fewer of them. There are fewer sauropods overall in the Cretaceous and um the remains of Cretaceous sauropods are less well known than Jurassic. Jurassic is really the, the era of the sauropod. Um, so, but yeah, so it's it's a little curious. Like, what was it that was driving such strong directional selection for such a long time? Because one of the things that you also find as you go from top to bottom on this list is that you were also more or less moving forward through time. So, I. I don't actually have a great answer other than that perhaps it's just economies of scale kept being kept being in favor of bigger and bigger organisms. Um, it certainly made it hard for predators to attack. So, you know, in the Jurassic, you have um, some relatively small sauropods, which were preyed upon by things like uh, Allosaurus or perhaps while well, young Ceratosaurus, things like that. But by the time you're getting to like, you know, dread notice, there's not a whole lot of predation going on on adult dread notice. So maybe that was a big part of it. Um, it's hard to say though. I will say though that uh, the effective, or sorry, efficient dinosaur and respiratory system probably contributed a lot to the fact that dinosaurs could get much bigger than mammals. 
because um, the biggest mammal that we know of on land, which was, um, oh, was that Rhino relative? Jackson, help me out. Indricotherium, I think. Oh, yep, you beat me to it. Yeah, okay. Indricotherium or Parasaurotherium or Beluchotherium, they're all this, <laughs> all synonyms. Yeah, they're all basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, that reached the size of some of the smallest sauropods, basically. And that's like the best land mammals have ever gotten, and they're probably not going to get much better than that anytime in the future, as far as better meaning just, you know, bigger growth size. Um, so yeah, it's... I think that the efficient respiratory system, along with economies of scale, are probably a decent explanation. However, um, you know, it's far from conclusive, and if you were, say, a budding paleontologist who wanted to get your name out there, maybe um, a paper on the persistence of strong directional selection in sauropodomorpha for gigantism would be an interesting topic to research. Indeed. Could be. But I think that's all I have for this slide. Sounds good to me. Ornithischia. Now, Ornithischia is a... Um, it's a bit of a cluster. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's okay. Look, Ornithischian systematics are a mess because the base of the Ornithischian family tree is not well known from fossils, which makes it hard to come up with well supported hypotheses about Ornithischian ancestry. Um, so we have uh, phylogeny here, and it does have some interesting areas. Like we have uh, Stexordae, uh, we have Thyreophora over here as label number two. I think one is probably, um, I think one is probably Neo-Ornithischia. Here we have Herosaurus as our outgroup. Um, we actually even have Pisanosaurus as an outgroup, so maybe I'm wrong. No, I guess Neotheropoda actually comes up at three. Yeah, I guess three. And then one is just Ornithischia because we have a Heterodontosaurus, Heterosaurodontidae, if I can talk, up past one morning. We have Pisanosaurus as our most basal, most Ornithischian. Um, yeah, unfortunately, while this does look like a nice orderly, uh, cladogram, uh, when you actually get down to the ground, there's a lot of fights about Ornithischian systematics. It's not at all clear. Um, there are some big groups though, uh, like Marginocephalia, which itself is grouped into the Pachycephalosaurs and the, um, oh, why am I, why am I doing this now? And the ceratopsians. The ceratopsians. Ceratopsians, yep. Uh, we have things like uh, ornithopods, which are uh, like hadrosaurs and guanodontians and things like that. Um, and then we have sort of the basal heterodontosauria types, which are, they basically remain small, um, sort of generalized, relatively swift running animals, some of which had weird teeth like heterodontosaurus, which basically had like pig tusks. But um, I think that's all I have for the broad overview of Ornithischia. It's a very contentious group. Uh, however, as far as I know, their monophyly has never been like seriously challenged. So it's a very consistently grouped together group of animals. But the exact relationships within Ornithischia are a bit thorny. So Jackson, you have anything? That sounds good to me. Okay. Shubity D. Theropoda. Now, theropoda might be the of the of sort of the the trio of sauropoda, theropoda, and ornithischia. Theropoda might be one of the best known groups. Uh, it's the oldest known group of dinosaurs. The first uh, dinosaur really identified as such was uh, Megaloceros, which is a theropod. It also has some of what uh, you might consider the most photogenic dinosaurs. I guess maybe the most charismatic, maybe. The ones that kids know. They are know. certainly popular in uh, in the media. Yeah. So when you think of a dinosaur, um, most people think of one big example from a few different groups. Most people think of things like T-Rex, uh, theropod. They think of like maybe Brachiosaurus or Brontosaurus, sauropod. And then maybe Triceratops, uh, which is, you know, Ornithischium. And then even within that, though, like think about the big animals in, say, Jurassic Park. Many of them theropods, Tyrannosaurus, Velociraptor, Dilophosaurus, uh, Spinosaurus, if you're looking into the, the later movies, Carnotaurus, Baryonyx. They're all the ones that are very easy to make into mon movie monsters, basically, because the, almost all of them are heavily 
focused on predation of other animals, especially other dinosaurs. Uh, they were the dominant land carnivores for basically all of the Jurassic and Cretaceous. There were other land carnivores, some of them fairly big, but um, none of them really established the same kind of dominance. And theropods were so successful that, one, they're the one group of dinosaurs that remains alive, which, you know, that's it's not nothing. Um, they also managed, by the end of the Cretaceous, to infiltrate a whole bunch of non-predatory niches. So, for instance, um, the Ornithomimids, as well as uh, things like Dinochiris and Therizinosaurus, and, the, and um, those were primarily herbivorous. We have the somewhat omnivorous... Um, of raptorosaurs. So it's a very diverse, very well studied group of dinosaurs. And um, yeah, like I said, they're also some of the most popular in terms of like popular media appearances. So yeah, I think that's it for me for now. Sounds good to me. Okay, the Jurassic. So this is the first period that we should really be thinking of as the time of the dinosaurs. Like I said, yeah, sure, there were dinosaurs in the, in the Triassic, and we shouldn't diminish the importance of such animals. However, I mean, come on. That's, that's not when you're getting most of your famous uh, animals. So the Jurassic, as it says, 201 to 145 million years ago. And it starts with the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, which wiped out large Pseudosuchians and allowed the dinosaurs to ascend to dominance, resulting from constant eruptions of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. So it's not entirely clear why the Pseudosuchians didn't make it out. There have been a whole bunch of hypotheses, um, ranging from simply dinosaurs had more efficient locomotion, which they did, um, which helped them basically hang on in times of relatively low... Uh, food abundance. I've heard things like uh, they had better water conservation, which maybe, um, like with many things, it's not always clear exactly why the dinosaurs made it out, but they sure did. And they took over pretty much all the megafaunal land niches and many of the other land niches that were previously occupied by other uh, reptiles. So, Jackson, you have anything there? Not really. Um... Jurassic is cool. Oh, whoops. We have a super chat that I see from Vandalia that says, Oh my goodness. Uh, Are uh, dinosaurs the only tetrapods that went from two walking limbs back to four? I'm trying, I was trying to put it up on the. Oh, I have just noticed the, that there has been an update somewhere in in youtube because it doesn't allow us to put it on screen yeah enough. i don't oh. see it. yeah well that's Dapper, do you have an answer to that um so i'm actually racking my brain trying to think of things that went from obligate bipeds to obligate quadrupeds other than dinosaurs um went from obligate bipeds to obligate quadrupeds i'm having trouble thinking of much because the thing is hmm. outside of well, okay, so one thing is, it might be the case that biped, obligate bipedality is basal to Archosauria as a whole. If that's the case, then many, then all quadrupedal Pseudosuchians also did that. So that is a possibility. Um, but I can't say for sure of any, any other ones. Then I could also just mean I'm not thinking of them. I, like, that I doesn't just mean can't they don't think exist. of any either. Yeah. As far as I know. Um, but thank you for the super chat. Yeah. One of the problems with those questions is like, in order to say no, I basically have to know about every single tetrapod litigation, and I don't. Are you kidding, Dapper? That's literally the only reason I have you, because you know about every tetrapod lineage. Well, I also know the difference between Spiralia and Ectisozoa. Fired. You're fired. Oh, all right. Well, I'll go somewhere else with my Thursdays. <laughs> uh, all right. Next slide. What are these? These aren't dinosaurs. These are echinoids. I, 
uh, the transition from urchins to sand dollars was occurring, at least in part, during the Jurassic. And so I just wanted to sh share with everybody that sand dollars are flat urchins. Fun mm -hmm. fact. And the, the fine little spokes that come up together at the top, those are homologous to the arms of uh, sea stars, which is yes. also fun. They're basically just sea stars that curled up in on themselves. Mm -hmm. yep. so. That's just all I wanted to show with this, just because it was okay. fun. Also, that, that very smooth uh, transition right there. Yeah, but um, Jackson, they stayed echinoderms. They didn't become a new kind. That's true. They didn't become bacteria <laughs> <laughs> or evolve into humans, did they? Right. So um, I don't know why you think this is evidence of evolution. Maybe they evolved into like sentient echinoids who then ascended to the stars. Who knows? You know? We probably, they could have, and we would probably never know. <laughs> yeah. Culture does not fossilize very well. So. No, it does not. Well, anyway. I mean, I don't have anything else for this because <laughs> the heck do I know about echinoderms? Yeah. Oh, I know they use me. two feet for way too many things. Yeah, the funny thing, so uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar. If you aren't, look it up. So you, you've seen, you're probably familiar with uh, sea stars have their little tube feet on the bottom. Well, mm -hmm. urchins have their tube feet essentially all over. They use them sort of like little hands to grab things. So they'll grab like kelp and then feed it to their mouth, which is on the underside. Or... If you are so inclined, look up urchins wearing hats. Because people will put little, like, plastic toy hats in tanks with urchins, and they'll pick them up and sort of put them on top. And it look like it's wearing a little top hat or a Viking helmet or something like that, and it's adorable. That does sound adorable. So, why do they do this? Why do they grab things? Uh, probably because uh, urchins are... To the top. Uh, probably because they're preyed upon by a variety of organisms like otters, uh, large mm. fish, even probably other echinoderms. And so they'll grab things like rocks, seaweed, um, probably anemones, other things, and sort of cover themselves with them as or, you know, to hide. Okay. That's fair. I, too, would probably hide if I were in their situation. Yeah. <laughs> they're very slow. They are pretty slow. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of unfortunate, really. Yep. Next slide, please. Ooh, early sauropods. Okay, so early sauropods is where we should start. First, I want to point out: look at Shunosaurus. It's a large animal. It's about the same size, roughly, as an elephant, which we think of as an exceptionally large animal today. However, I want you, to get, you guys to realize that, look at that femur, and I want you to realize that most femora that you find from the more famous sort of taxa of sauropods would be taller than that human. And this one isn't, like, at all. So we're still getting that same kind of sense of the significant increase in size through time. Uh, we're also getting things like, if you look very carefully, you can see that there are individual little toes on the forelimbs. That's something that happens in early sauropods, but that by the time we get to much later sauropods, um, the foot, the front feet don't actually even have digit bones. They just end at metacarpals. That's it, except for digit one, which retains a claw in some forms, but in very late forms, even that goes away. And so um, you get these late sauropods that have extremely derived features. And these more basal sauropods are interesting because they're showing us significantly less derivation. You can also see this in things like the uh, vul Vulcanodon, there was, I was about to press pronounce it, and uh, Baraposaurus, where even their hind limbs are less derived, they're less columnar. And so later on, sauropods will start to shorten the length uh, that the foot projects out to the front because there, you have to have these adaptations called graviportal which means that you're basically just adapting to being gigantic. You have to support your weight. And one of the big ways to do that is to make your limbs as columnar as possible. Don't waste any energy making any tissue that isn't directly supporting weight or protecting from infection, basically. I'm sure if infection weren't a thing, sauropods would probably be like, you know what? I don't need skin. Too much weight. So, um, Jackson, I don't know if you have anything on there. A truly horrifying thought. 
Yeah, I mean, raise sore pods in a sterile environment. Watch them lose their skin. Ultimately, that's the only reason you have skin is to protect yourself from infection. And maybe to keep your 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 fluids in, I guess. I mean, yeah, but still. Harrowing. <laughs> I'm going to write a sci-fi story about a, a group of people who live in a sterile space colony and their skin gets so thin that uh, you can just see their muscles right through it. Mm. So Tasty it's stuff. Good, it's, good, it's a good sci-fi story right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're also going to be really gangly because they're in low gravity. <laughs> they're going to look like actual horror movie monsters, except that they're like paper thin and you could like destroy them with like a sneeze. So, you know, they're actually very, very, very pathetic. But anyway, I'm good with this slide. Okay. <laughs> now that we've talked about weird horror movie people. Ah, uh, Mementosauridae. So interestingly, Mementosauridae, until fairly recently, really only had Mementosaurus in it. And um, only the last few years have we been discovering a few more. Um, Mementosauridae is a group of uh, sauropods that are, one, known for taking the long neck meme and then just turning it up to 11. I mean, look at these guys. It is, it's kind of ridiculous, even for a sauropod. Like, what are you doing? Come on. Um, the other thing is that they are some of the only sauropods known from China, which makes them kind of interesting. Um, it looks like China had an oddly low amount of sauropod diversity for some reason in the Jurassic. Um, I don't know of any explanation that's been offered. Um, and actually, only I think only last week, I actually read a description of a new Mementosaurid, which I think at the time was only the second Mementosaurid ever discovered. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, they're Chinese Jurassic sauropods, really big old necks. And we don't have a great amount of information about their cranium or even some parts of the axial skeleton. Uh, one of the things is with most dinosaurs, skulls are one of the most common things that you find because skulls are usually some of the biggest bones in the body. And the um, fossil record overall has a bias towards big bones. However, sauropods, things like the femur and some of the vertebrae are actually bigger than the skull as a whole. So sauropod skulls are actually not very well known compared to other parts of the anatomy. So a lot of what we know from Amenchisauridae is uh, actually just axial skeletons minus the cranium, which is kind of too bad, but what are you gonna do, right? And I think, unless Jackson, you have anything about Mementosauridae? I'm not fat. I'm just big boned. <laughs> oh, uh, we have another another super chat from Vandalia for four ninety nine. He said, "When did these sauropods? When did these sauropods had to live in the water? When? Okay, when? Okay, when was it that the the um, the incorrect idea that all sauropods had to live in the water? When was that debunked? So." I actually don't know exactly when that was overturned. I know that that was still a common idea in um, like some like the early 1980s. So if you're looking at like 1980s paleo art and stuff, you're still going to see sauropods wallowing in the water. Um, but so I don't know for certain. But if I had to like offer my best educated guess, I would say probably around the same time as the rest of the dinosaur revolution, which was in sort of the early to mid 90s. This is when we realized that, hey, the the previous ideas and memes in paleo art about dinosaurs as lizard-like lumbering beasts who just couldn't hack it once the mammals who were faster and more efficient and smarter evolved, that kind of just went away. And we realized that, no, many dinosaurs were big, active, in many cases, fast land animals who were every bit a match for most modern mammals. Um, and that really kind of kicked off with the careful description of uh, animals like uh, Dromaeosaurus and Deinonychus. So we sort of have the raptors to thank for the dinosaur revolution because it was just so obvious that these couldn't be slow lumbering beasts because they were just so obviously built for speed. So um, yeah, that's my, my answer is, I don't know exactly, but I'm very confident it was part of the overall dinosaur revolution that happened in the early 90s. And I think that's all I have for that super chat. Jackson? Fair enough. All right. Diplo, 
I, I can never say this word correctly the first time. Diplodocoidea. There we go. <laughs> it's for some reason all the words derived from Dipl uh, Diplodocus always just get me. Uh, so Diplodocoidea is one of the classic groups of sauropods that people think about when they think of sauropods. It's got Diplodocus, which is one of the most famous. Um, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, which is a valid taxon again. Congratulations to Brontosaurus. Um, which I don't see a Brontosaurus up here. Jackson, what are you doing to me? Uh, Jackson's unavailable right now. Please leave a message after the tone. They, that, the taxon got resurrected from the dustbin of nope. paleontology, only not for real. you to not even represent it on here. Doesn't deserve it. <laughs> okay, so Diplodo Diplodocoidea is one of the relatively basal groups of sauropods. Um, they do have some derived features. Uh, most notably, they do have the uh, reduction, the <laughs> radical reduction and <laughs> elimination of digit bones in um, the mani that you get in later sauropods. But they also have relatively primitive skulls. Uh, they don't have the gigantic and very high up uh, nares like you get in macronarians. Uh, they also don't reach the same kinds of sizes that you get with things like uh, titanosaurs. Uh, one idea, which I think is somewhat reasonable, is that they may have actually been largely grazers rather than high browsers. And in fact, they were not carrying their heads up high, but instead were using their heads to create a large feeding area of relatively low cover plants in front of them. That might be the case, although I'm sure that they could lift their heads and get some relatively high branches too. However, they did exist in ecosystems with much taller animals who were probably the specialized high browsers. Um, I will say uh, also, uh, I'm not a huge fan of how obvious the coracoid bone is on our apatosaurus on the bottom left uh, or our supersaurus. Um, the coracoid is used for muscle attachment, guys. It should be covered in muscles. It shouldn't be something that you can just make out easily. So that's um that's an idea in paleo art called shrink wrapping, where you want to make as many bones as possible visible. But the thing is, if you look at modern animals, even if you look at say modern mammals without fur or modern reptiles, you can't see all of their bones because they're covered in muscles. Why would you be able to? That wouldn't make sense. If they didn't need those muscles, they would just have smaller bones, save the weight. Um so yeah, this I'm just using these bits of paleo art as an excuse to talk about coracoid bones and why you shouldn't just have them be exposed. Oh, I and have... it just occurs to me, people might not know what a coracoid is because humans don't have those. And if, a, if it's a bone that humans don't have, people don't know about it. The coracoid bone is the big shoulder bone that you see projecting sort of like uh, posterior ventral, posterior dorsally, sorry, up from the shoulder joint of a uh, supersaurus and apatosaurus. Um, I, I will say uh, that there were lots of sauropods found in the Morrison Formation, um, many of which were diplodocoids. This and is true. Donald Prothero and uh, Darren Nash got into a fight over whether or not many of these were separate species or, in fact, ontogenetic series within like only a couple of species. Yeah, that's so. one of the tricky things about um, paleotaxa is so we have you know, paleotaxon, you have to use a morphos species definition because there's nothing else available to you. You don't know anything about their reproduction or anything like that. But the problem then becomes that if you have ontogenetic stages, which are just growth stages of the same species, it can be hard to tell because the same criteria that you would use to distinguish two species, if you're just naively applying them ac across your various specimens, will also tell you that different ontogenetic stages of the same species are different species. And this is a problem throughout um, uh, paleontology, especially with areas where the fossil record is relatively spotty, uh, or just it's more of a problem going farther back in time because we have fewer and fewer uh, living animals who are good representatives. So, yeah. Also, I want to point out, if you look at the plants in these pictures, um, it does not look a whole lot like the plants that we have now. You basically have some, like... Uh, sort of pine tree relatives, um, monkey puzzle bush type thing, or monkey puzzle tree type things. Um, no grass, uh, no flowers. Plants were definitely not doing the kind of things that they're doing, they're doing today. Or at least the, the dominant plants now, which are mostly flowering plants, did not exist at this point. So, yeah. I think I've got diplodoc... 
Koidia, which is again a word I cannot say first try. I hate you, Jackson, for making me have to say it. I think that's all I got for them. Just get good, Dapper. Um, get good. I'll tell you what. You tell me whether snails are ectisozoans or spiralians reliably, and then I'll get good. They're obviously spiralians. And yeah, obviously, not all cartoons make it easy to tell what they are at first brush. Okay. Blush. First blush, not first brush. Anyways, <laughs> next slide. Macronaria. Hey, I already mentioned Macronaria. Okay, so Macronaria are so called because they have gigantic nares. What's a nares? Or was a nares? Yeah. A nares is the entrance uh, in your skull that your nasal passage goes through. But it's not the same as a nostril because the nostril is the fleshy bit. A nostril is usually smaller than a nares. There you go. Macronaria had gigantic nares, and it's not entirely clear why. Maybe they were using them uh, to make sound. Although, with such long necks, the recurrent laryngeal nerve would have made uh, careful uh, calls virtually impossible. Basically, a sauropod would decide to make some kind of sound, and then, you know, a few seconds later, it would actually make the sound, and it probably couldn't really control it. Um, it could also have just been things like um, modulating air temperature. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, there's... It, could have actually just been for olfactory purposes. It's as far as I know, it's not clear why. Uh, these are also some animals like I was talking about earlier, where um, the Diplodocus and buddies were sharing the environment with much taller animals. These are the taller animals I'm talking about, Macronarians. This is also the group to which our last sauropods belong, um, and so this is where a lot of things like Brachiosaurus, Giraffatitan, Camarasaurus. Um, fun fact. Most people who think of Brachiosaurus are actually thinking of Giraffa Titan because back when Brachiosaurus became famous, around the same time as, uh, say, Jurassic Park, much of it was actually reconstructed using material from Giraffa Titan, an African but closely related species that was much better known. But Brachiosaurus is from the United States, so it's American. That makes it better. Because people just kind of ignore Jurassic dinosaurs from Africa. It's, it's USA. like a thing. USA. Yeah, basically. Uh, actually, a large part of it is that at the time of things like the Bone Wars, when a large portion of you know dinosaurs are still valid, were discovered, um, the United States was relatively easy to access in terms of political stability and stuff like that. And it's still the case that it's easier to do dinosaur digs in, say, like Canada or the United States than it is in, say, like Mali. So um, unfortunately for science... Uh, science cannot really be completely divorced from things like politics and war and things like that. And so um, that's one of the reasons why uh, only recently has China become such a big frontier for uh, dinosaur paleontology. It's because only recently has it become politically tenable for scientists the world over to collaborate in China on paleontological digs. Because until recently, uh, no, that was not reasonably possible. Uh, so hopefully someday... Uh, that the same thing will be true in much of Africa, and I'm sure that when that happens, we will discover all sorts of really cool stuff all over Africa. As it is right now, there's only a few places in Africa where it's really easy to dig, and a lot of those aren't places well known for their uh, Mesozoic stuff. Like um, there's like the Karoo Formation in South Africa, but that's Permian, so you're not really going to get any dinosaurs there. But yeah, um, I think that's all I have for Macronaria. I think we do we have more sauropod slides because if we do, they're still probably Macronarians. Uh, I think in the Cretaceous, when we get there, there'll be more. Uh, I don't remember what the next slide is for this one, honestly. Nope. Okay. So that's, we're done with uh, sauropods until the Cretaceous. Okay, so we have Lesothosaurus, which, uh, fun fact, Africa. You can tell because it's from Lesotho, which is that little country that exists inside of South Africa for some reason. Um, I don't know that reason. I just know that it exists. It's weird. It's like San Marino is like exist, existing entirely inside Italy. Like, why bother? And the answer, at least for San Marino, which might be the same for Lesotho, is because you're not going to tell them they don't count anymore. Um, Agilosaurus, and I think actually probably the most interesting one here is Scutellosaurus. Scutellosaurus is actually our first um, animal on the lineage that is going to lead to both Stegosaurids and Ankylosaurids. Stegosaurids being some of the big Jurassic uh, thyreophorans, and ankylosaurids being much, much more important in the Cretaceous. But here you can start to see the beginning of that armor, uh, because the thyreophorans are, are basically like the, the shield bearers or the armor bearers. Scutellosaurus literally means shield lizard. 
And so we're getting sort of this differentiation, even here early in the Jurassic, even though we did have some very late Triassic um, Ornithischians, but here we're getting into things like, you know, Neotheropoda um, and Thyreophora. So, but also I want to note that Lesothosaurus, which looks very small, is actually not much smaller than Scutellosaurus. All of these animals are pretty small at this point um, when we're talking about really early basal Ornithischians. It takes a while for them to get really big, but by the time we get to the end Cretaceous, there are enormous uh, Ornithischians dominating the land fauna in terms of herbiv herbivory throughout most of the world. Basically, uh, by the time you get to the end Cretaceous, uh, sauropods are hanging on in South America, but pretty much everywhere else, they're basically have are gone. Um, I'm good with this slide. Are you, Jackson? Uh, Lesothosaurus is one of those dinosaurs, one of those ornithischians that Dapper mentioned earlier, where there's a lot of uh, controversy about where it falls exactly. Like how basal or basally derived is it with respect to the other ornithischians? And that kind of depends on who you ask, basically. So, because it is very basal in the ornithischian tree, the question is just how basal is it? So, yeah. But since you made the slides, anyway. Jackson, I'm, I'm a little bit taken aback. Uh, so the, the, the woman from the disco music era in the bell bottom striking a pose. <laughs> uh, that's pretty random in all of this. So I did that absolutely on purpose. What are you talking about? <laughs> so here, here's the thing. The, the standard um, the stand. human stand in in paleo art is just a silhouette of a man at 1.8 meters. But you get tired of drawing a 1.8 meter, basically T-posed human male <laughs> in silhouette over and over and over, or just well, using it every it's time. Robert Bacher, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes it's, it's Robert Bacher. So sometimes paleo artists like to just change it up. Yeah, just, yeah it stands out. But it still, gives you, it still gives you an idea. Although one thing is like, unless you have a, a scale, humans vary considerably in height. Um, like you see like a human male there and like that could be a whole host of heights. Like that could be like five, two we're doing Imperial here. That could be, you know, the standard 1.8 meters. That could be 2.2 meter. Who knows? Yeah. Also bell bottoms were made to make you, your legs look longer. So there is that. Were they? I don't know. I'm Wait, just, so I'm just making why, stuff so, up. Okay, because I was about to ask, like, so is that why I had bell bottoms in my dress uniform in the Navy? Because it doesn't seem like it, but what do I know? I also know that those pants had 13 buttons, which is about 12 too many. <laughs> oh, really? Wait, yeah, were they it, all were they all your like, you know, instead of a zipper, you have like 13 buttons? Yep. So instead of a zipper, there were 13 buttons. Um, and then in order to slightly adjust like the waist size there was a <clears throat> there were laces in the back like shoelaces and you could cinch those tighter or looser and then tie them and that was how you you tighten them because men's navy uh blue dress uniform pants in the united states navy basically haven't changed their design since the revolutionary war it's one of the Makes oldest to me it's one of the oldest uniform items currently in use in the united states military it's ridiculous i hate them they were horrible I actually knew some people who installed zippers, sewed the buttons directly onto the outside, and then used Velcro on top of that. But that required heavy modification. It wasn't technically allowed, but since none of it was visible from the outside, you were unlikely to get hit on it during an inspection. But that was like custom modification you had. You had to hack your pants if you wanted to do that. But uh, that has nothing to do with Ornithischians, so I think we should go on. I'm not All going. Right. I'm Thyreophora. not even going to address the woman in the right now because. Yeah, I think that's a thing for Jackson now. He's, he's there's also a his... dude in the bottom right. Yeah, yeah. come at me. There's also a naked right. woman in the Look top at left, a uh, top right. Sorry, I don't think I, she's naked. She I at least has. That she's naked. Uh, she at least has high heels, and it looks like she has a handbag. So, mm. you know, that's... she's walking that gargoyleosaurus down the street. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so Thyre of Fora, as we already mentioned, um, unfortunately, I sort of went a bit too far into Thyre of Fora, But yeah, there's the two big groups are Ankylosauridae, which includes the Ankylosaurines that actually have the club tail and the um, Notosaurines that don't have the club tail. Um, and the other big group is the Stegosaurines. Uh, Stegosaurus is sort of the, the poster child for Stegosauridae. And by the way, Jackson, your current Stegosaurus is a little bit out of date. Um, we found more cervical elements. and has a much longer neck than this. So I blame you. Bite me. Um, Bite me. Come at me. Come I mean, do you really, me. really want to go fight a, a, a Ceratosaurus? Also, don't say come fight me. I know where you work, man. Come on. I, I will. I, you know what? We'll put you in a tank. Come at me. <laughs> like I can't Let's swim. Let's see. You can swim with those tiny arms. I'd like to see it. Um, it's it's back foot powered there, Jackson. Come on. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. Well, so Kentrosaurus is always a fun uh, stegosaurid because it one its its plates kind of turn more and more spike like as it, they go posteriorly. It has these big honking shoulder spikes, which are actually pretty common in Thyreophoran stegosaurids included. Uh, stegosaurus, like I said, it's a weird example of stegosaurids, despite the thing, despite being the thing that the whole family is named for. Um, and so it's also uh, a fun because it's another African taxon. We don't get all that many of those, uh, which means I'm going to point it out whenever I notice that there is one because uh, African dinosaurs and the Jurassic don't get enough love. Um, also, it's one of the dinosaurs that I bought for my nephew when I was making sure that he had very realistic and as accurate as possible dinosaur toys. So, um, yeah, and thyriforans bring up an, a, a question that comes up with uh, some mammals, specifically porcupines, which is um, how they mate. And the answer is we don't know. Very carefully. Uh, that's how porcupines do it. it. It literally is just very carefully. The, um, the female has to just be very careful that she doesn't raise her spikes. Uh, but the thing is, with porcupines, they can raise the, raise the spikes because... Um, you know those the the pilus erector muscles that you have that make it give you goosebumps. Whenever you have goosebumps, it's because your um, what is it, pylorus pil, pil, I don't know. I can't think. I can't remember the, the plural, but it's because your erector pili muscles have uh, contracted. But that's not a thing that dinosaurs have, and so um, or at least it's not clear that they would have an analog for, of that for things like spikes. So those spikes were probably immobile. So, uh, yeah, there's been a whole bunch of suggested methods like um, tail to tail, uh, side to side, just very, very, very long penises that are very, very flexible. Um, yeah. And the answer is no one knows. No one knows for sure. But there are options. It's not like it's a mystery in the sense of like, well, this couldn't possibly have happened. Dinosaurs are fake, which is a position I've heard that people have taken. Dinosaurs must be t must be fake because they couldn't have made it. It's like, no, you're just not being imaginative. Which is weird because it's usually an area where people are very imaginative. But anyway, I think I think we've covered Thyre 4 pretty well between the previous slides and this slide. So unless Jackson has anything, I say we move on to the next one. Have at it. All right. Early Jurassic theropods. Hey, look, there's me. As you guys might know, I'm a Ceratosaurus, even though people th seem to think that I'm a Stegosaurus. I don't know why. Um, we also have Dilophosaurus and Seg Segosaurus or Segosaurus. You know what? Here's my rule for pronouncing these names. Pronounce each letter in a reasonable manner, and you're probably good. Uh, okay, so Ceratosaurus is an important Jurassic theropod for one big reason. Uh, one, it's me. But two, the other big reason is that it actually sets up one of the two going forward major groups of dinosaurs where we have the ceratosauroidea and the other side where we have um is it tetanura jackson do you remember i think you're is it yeah i think you're I right think it's yeah and tetanura. Then, then tetanura is avitheropoda right oh yeah that's where so most okay. of the most of the theropods that you've heard of are actually in tetanura uh, Ceratosaurus and the Ceratosauroidea are the other group there, and that includes things like um, the Abelosaurids, like uh, Majungasaurus and Carnotaurus. Um, Ceratosaurus also is interesting in that we have a lot of integument from it, and it does not seem to have had feathers. Um, we don't have any evidence for feathers. We do have a lot of evidence for not feathers. Uh, Sigisaurus and Dilophosaurus, on the other hand, are actually uh, basal to both Ceratosaurus and uh, Tetanura, 
and they are sort of the the last members of these sort of basal, relatively primitive uh, theropods that you're getting coming out of the Triassic. So they're more like Coelophysis than later theropods would be. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not more closely related to, say, Ceratosaurus or Allosaurus than they are to Coelophysis. It might just mean that they're still closer to those two, but basically branching so they have relatively primitive morphologies. Um, in fact, you can actually see all three of these animals actually retain four fingers, which is a very primitive condition for theropods. Theropods very quickly go to three fingers, and then in some cases, two fingers, like in the Tyrannosauroids. So the, the idea that these guys have visible fourth digits is somewhat unusual. In fact, most theropods even lose the metacarpal for digit four. So, uh, yeah, we're still not quite at the point where we have a theropod body plan just nailed down. There's still some, some of these primitive features coming in here. Uh, Jackson, you got anything? Nope, sounds good to me. All right, let's do it. Next slide. Allosauroidea. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we have Allosaurus fragilis. On, uh, we have Metriacanthosaurus. I can't say the word. Uh, also, Saurophaganax maximus might just be Allosaurus maximus. Uh, Saurophaganax is a bit of a Big nomen dubium. Yeah. Um, so Saurophaganax, which just means um, lizard eater. It's, it's the biggest lizard eater is basically what that name means. Whereas Allosaurus fragilis means fragile other lizard, which I think is kind of a lame name, if I'm being honest. Um, a sort of, so Saurophaganax, it's not clear whether or not it's actually distinct enough to warrant its own generic name as opposed to Allosaurus. Um, Allosaurus is more closely related to many of the later Cretaceous dinosaurs that you're, are most famous, like, you know, uh, the raptors and T-Rex and whatnot. It's also by far the most common animal in the Morrison Formation. It is ridiculous how many Allosaurus uh, specimens there are in the Morrison Formation. Uh, so much so that at one point there was a debate as to how an ecosystem could possibly exist with this many gigantic predators. And the current thinking is that it's probably a taphonomic bias combined with predator traps. So a predator trap is an area where uh, predators are drawn, but then they tend to die there. Uh, famously, the La Brea tar pits are like this, where you just have ridiculous numbers of carnivores in there. And the idea is that they were probably drawn in by dying other animals who were trapped there, then they themselves became trapped there, started dying, then attracting other predators, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it could be that there were predator traps. And Allosaurus also uh, seems to have been especially adapted to hunt the sauropods that we saw earlier. And so remember, these are still not the biggest of sauropods. So these are things that an Allosaurus could reasonably handle. And one of the reasons uh, that we think this is, one, we can find evidence of predation by things consistent with Allosaurus on sauropod fossils. Uh, but also, uh, in order to take a, a sauropod is basically just a wall of flesh, basically. And in order to take a bite out of that, you have to be able to really, really open your jaws really wide. And Allosaurus could get to almost 90 degrees worth of uh, jaw opening. It's ridiculous the degree to which they could open their jaws. And so that's probably an adaptation to trying to bite just a, a vertical wall of flesh. Um, it's also apparent from uh, some ichnofossils that we have, some, some trackways, that allosauroid or allosaurids, so not necessarily allosaurus, because remember, you can't really positively tie an ichnofossil to a particular fossil taxon uh, directly in most cases. And this is one of those cases. But animals consistent with allosaurus were chasing down sauropods in some kind of group. Now, the group doesn't seem to be very well coordinated. It seems like they just kind of mobbed animals from many directions without much coordination. So we're not really doing pack hunting, but it does seem like we're at least tolerating conspecifics in feeding contexts, which is a pretty big step up. Many animals, even mammals today, don't tolerate conspecifics at their kills. So that is at least some level of um, sociality, which is unusual in reptiles overall. It's still unusual in birds, really. Most birds are not very social. So it's it's an interesting little fact about um, Allosaurus that it looks like they were somewhat social. Um, Jackson, you got anything else? Nope. Sounds good to me. Oh, one of my pet peeves with the otherwise quite good um, Walking with Dinosaurs documentary is that they put the little horns on Allosaurus 
uh, behind the orbits rather than in front of the orbits. And I don't know why they did that. It's a weird little thing that they got that very, very, very wrong for what I can tell, no reason. So uh, yeah, don't take the uh, Walking with Dinosaurs, Allosaurus as gospel. Of course, th that show is so old now that you really shouldn't take much of it with uh, like at face value. But anyway, uh, Peter, I think we are good with this slide. Megalosauroidea. So originally Megalosauroidea was a waste bin taxon. Basically big theropods <laughs> were Megalosauroids and small ones were Silurosaurs. And that was it. Since then, um, more work has been done and Megalosaurus, which you see up there compared to a 1.8 meter tall person, is sort of the prototype dinosaur. It is the first dinosaur that was described. It was one of the two that gave uh, Sir Richard Owen the idea that Dinosauria was its own uh, particular taxon that had its own definable traits, uh, which primarily had to do with things like the hip and the skull. Um, and basically, these are uh, tetanurids, but they're relatively basal tetanurids. Uh, you're not seeing a lot of the really crazy specializations like you see in Tyrannosauroidea or um, Manoraptora. So you're getting like, you know, decently sized arms, three fingers, uh, relatively generalized theropod skulls, um, tails for balance, horizontal spine posture. Uh, but it is nice that now we actually have animals that coherently fit into a group that we can say are megalosauroid, megalosauroidians, sorry rather than just having anything that's big enough just get tossed into Megalosauroidea. So Megalosauroidea is sort of a story of, it's it's almost more a story about how paleontologists figured out how to do dinosaur systematics than it is a story about the dinosaurs themselves, which is too bad because there's some really cool uh, Megalosauroidean dinosaurs. But um, yeah, I, I actually do think one of the most interesting things about them is just the degree to which our definitions of the taxon has have changed over time as we realize what what was really related to what? And uh, Jackson, you got anything? Sort of similar to what happened for Insectivora among the mammals. Yeah, except is, it, is Insectivora still even a taxon? Well, I mean, it's the it became Ulipatifla. Um, it's not it's not Insectivora anymore. But the remaining members who you know weren't either like Aardvarks or Golden Moles or Tenrex. So the shrews, hedgehogs, and true moles are Ulipatifla. So you're telling me that dolphins are no longer insectivores? Uh, for for anyone wondering what on earth that means, <laughs> there's a certain paleo hack. amateur of hack. Yes. Yeah, he's a hack. Uh, David Peters, who mm -hmm. thinks that dolphins are descended from Tenrex because Tenrex do echolocation. Never mind that some mice and also like bats do echolocation that doesn't matter i guess whatever jackson i actually have a, a proposal for you <laughs> oh, God. how would you feel about coming on my channel sometime and reading a david peters paper with me that sounds hilarious it does, that does i tried to read funny. i tried to read his um hippos or desmostylians paper while i was at the grand canyon i couldn't get past like page two i just was laughing too hard um, we'll probably hope we'll hopefully talk about Desmostylians in the Cenozoic section, though. And, and, and just, that's a hint to Jackson to go double check to see a, if Desmostylians are in there, and if not, add them. That's uh, that is certainly a question that we can. Uh... Yeah, if I remember correctly, at one point you were asked to do a video about aquatic mammals, and you skipped over Desmostylians entirely, didn't you, Jackson? I have no love for them in my heart. <laughs> you need to correct this for our Cenozoic section. The only, like, what is it, aquatic extinct mammals, right? Extinct yeah, it's the only order uh, extinct of order of aquatic mammals, yeah. Although yeah. they were less aquatic than, say, cetaceans. They were probably about as aquatic as, like, pinnipeds. Yeah. Let's see. But, uh, I guess I can check right now. Jackson, right, but let's get to just, the next slide. Just, just, uh, just to mess with Mr. Peters, someone should tell him that in the Netherlands there are several blind people who have developed echolocation uh, as a form to get around. They must be descended from dolphins. Yes, so <laughs> we we need to see where they came from. Someone should just mention it to him. Um, yeah, I think that's at like the start uh, of the. The chapter the blind watch or the chapter in the blind watchmaker by dawkins on uh, the evolution of echolocation he talks about how like 
there's an analog where there was even like a person who could ride a bicycle relatively well uh, using like the sounds in the environment. Like it, he could like figure out how close stuff was. So mm -hmm. pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. Humans yes, are crazy, is. man. But, but they're uh, also yeah. Cenozoic animals. Um, yeah, there it was. It was determined recently that like a species of mouse is called like the long furred mouse or something like that. Uh, is capable of echolocation. So, um, you'd think it would be called the echolocating mouse since that's a way more interesting feature than long hair. Well, I think it was, I think it was, a, uh, you know, found to be long haired first. Yeah. And then later they sense. were like, oh, it can do echolocation. That's neat. True. That is oh. probably the order of events there. Jackson, do you know what, uh, bats are called in the Netherlands if you would translate it? directly is it flutter mouse yeah it it's it would be flat mouse it's the same flutter thing in mouse. german yeah it would flat be mouse? Okay. flat mouse so okay. it's basically the same thing in german because yeah. german only has like five words for animals it's got Question. like mouse cow dog bear pig and that's basically it are desmostylians still considered afrothairs i do not know i would actually have to double check on that oof I mean, I've okay. never claimed to be an expert in Desmostylians. Well, I I think I remember seeing that, but I'm not positive. So, I mean, they kind of look like Afrothers. We we have still one up on the Germans because we do have a uh, bird beak animal. And I'll, I'll I'll let you guess what that is. Is it the platypus? It is. Germanic languages are too easy when it comes to animal names, man. Mm-hmm. It's like what's a what's a turtle? Oh, it's a shield lizard. Okay, or shield toad. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it. they. Oh, it their uh, position has been disputed. So. Uh oh. Well, time well, to just toss them in Whipamorpha. Why not? <laughs> oh God! Please make it end. <laughs> well, we could make it end, but the slide hasn't changed. <laughs> oh, there uh, it is. Bird evolution. All right, so. Despite the fact that a lot of the really cool stuff talking about uh, really close to birds is actually coming out of the Cretaceous, the actual divergence of crown aves probably occurred in the Jurassic. And we have basically birds in the Jurassic. Um, Archaeopteryx was one of the most famous and earliest transitional fossils, so-called, because uh, there's really no... There's not a very rigorous way to define what counts as transitional in the fossil record, but whatever. Um and it actually even vindicated some of Darwin's ideas about the evolution of birds from dinosaurs because Darwin, as well as other people, had noticed that dinosaur skeletons, especially theropod dinosaur skeletons, were very similar in very many ways to uh, bird skeletons. And so Darwin hypothesized that maybe we would find um, a skeleton of a reptile-like animal with, you know, like long tail bones, unfused three fingers with claws, and uh, perhaps feet with separate but closely associated metatarsal bones. And lo and behold, before he actually, well, I think well before he died, Archaeopteryx was found. I think only like a couple of years after he suggested. It was just, it was, yeah, 19, or sorry, 1861. So just two years after Origin was published. Yeah. So, I mean, this was an idea that was vindicated really fast, which is something that when people quote mine his section about the paucity of the fossil record, no one ever brings that part up. That two years later, something that just fit one of his actual predictions was found. And so but, the, um, the funny thing about that, uh, since you brought it up, was he he actually included in later editions uh, more transitional fossils that were discovered in his lifetime, like uh, uh, um, early uh, like early whales uh, and early um, uh, Serenians, which still had like the hind limbs. So, hmm. yeah, by like the sixth edition, he was going Wow, look at all these transitional fossils that have been discovered, which kind of vindicate evolution. How interesting. <laughs> Neat, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> here we have a clanogram uh, go basically going um, forward in time as we go left to right and going closer and closer to birds as we go top to bottom. And one of the things that you'll notice about that is it also means that as we go from uh, bottom to top, we also are more or less going forward in time. Uh, so we have crown group birds up at the top. That kind of looks like Gallus? It doesn't actually have a, uh, a a generic name, but it looks enough like Gallus that I'm I'm kind of kind of I'm just kind of 
go with Gallus for now? Do you have any objections to me assuming that that's a Gallus there, Jackson? You are the resident theropod. It's up to you. Well, I mean, okay, but it, I mean, it could just as easily be like like a, a juvenile Galapavo or something. So who knows? Uh, anyway, so at the moment we have crocodiles and the relatives represented by a uh, terrestrial Pseudosuchian predator, uh, probably in the Rausukian group. Now, the Rausukians aren't an actual clade. They're an evolutionary grade of Pseudosuchian land predators, but we're not going to get too far into that. Um, then we have uh, what looks like a Sphenosuchian, which is, I don't know why we have what looks like a Sphenosuchian, but sure, why not? Uh, listen, though, we have Pterosaurus, so we're getting closer and closer. Uh, we get then to Ornithischia, and this is using the traditional classification system, and Sauropodomorpha, and so we're getting closer and closer. And one of the things that you'll notice is that once we really get into the dinosaurs, you start to get things that have more and more adaptations to cursoriality. And what cursoriality is, is running. And also, we're getting relatively small animals. So you're getting things like Rahonavis, Oviraptor. Um, there's some kind of Deinonychosaur that I don't know exactly which one it is, because it's hard to tell. Uh, could be Microraptor, I don't know. But um, one of the things that this illustrates, though, is that some of the closest animals to birds are, in fact, the, rap the raptors, so-called the dromaeosaurs or the Deinonychosauria, which includes Troodontidae. Um, and yeah, this is, if you were to go back in time to the late Jurassic or throughout much of the Cretaceous, you would have a hard time telling which things were birds and which things weren't, because a large number of the animals would be lightly built, feathery animals that have what look like wings. You know, they have primary and secondary feathers, uh, full veined feathers, contour feathers, phyllo plumes, the whole nine yards. And so while right now birds are a very distinct group of organisms that if you just take extant organisms, don't seem closely aligned to anything else. <laughs> you went back to the Jurassic or the, uh, well, the, the late Jurassic or the Cretaceous, uh, birds would be just one amongst a huge menagerie of feathery dinosaurs. Um, if you want more in-depth looks at bird anatomy and stuff like that, I have a whole bunch of videos over on my channel uh, where I talk about things like bird evolution. I have some debates about whether or not birds are dinosaurs. Spoiler alerts. Yes. Yes, they are. Um, so yeah, I encourage you, if you really want to look a lot more, dig into the Dapper Dinosaur back catalog. Um, I think we should probably switch the slides unless Jackson has something else for this section. Nope, you're good. Okay. Okay, Cretaceous. So this is the final part of the era of the dinosaurs, going from 145 to 66 million years ago. Now, many of you are probably still thinking that it's 65 million years ago. Uh, that has been revised with better measurements. It is now known to be much closer to 66 than 65. However, I'm still not going to go around complaining about people who say 65. When you're talking about 66 million years old, 1 million years is not that much time. Um, so <clears throat> unlike the transition between most of the previous um, eras that we were talking about, or actually um, periods, so you know between the Permian and the Triassic and the Triassic and the Jurassic, Jurassic there was no extinction event. The beginning of the Cretaceous period was... I mean, if you were on the ground, you probably wouldn't have noticed that you had switched from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous. Uh, there was strong continuity in the fauna and flora between the two periods. And basically, the reason that the Cretaceous gets it, even gets its name is because some of the famous uh, formations that were made during the Cretaceous had a bunch of chalk in them, which because Cretaceous literally means chalky. And so there were some famous chalk beds that were deposited during the Cretaceous, so it got its own name. Also, if you lumped it in with the Jurassic, that would make the Jurassic, if you decide to call the whole thing Jurassic, very, very long. Um, so basically, the Jurassic to Cretaceous represents one of the longest continuous periods of relative ecological stability and lack of major extinction events. Now, there were minor extinctions here and there, but like there were no, there was nothing even close to, say, the end Cretaceous or the uh, Triassic-Jurassic extinction event. Um, the continents are starting to look like their modern forms. So this is where we start to get differences between, say, South American and African uh, organisms. So when you go back to the Jurassic, you'll notice that there were a lot of things going back and forth there. That's why there were a lot of 
fiery of foreigns on both sides. That's why there were um, uh, Ceratosauroidians on both sides. But now this divide is starting. And so we're starting to get um, significant differences. Now at this point, um, we're still getting South America, Antarctica, and Australia connected by land for most of this period. And South, Af South America close to Africa. So there is still uh, interchange between species all across that area. And actually there's more of a north-south divide at this time than there is now where there's sort of an east-west divide where Africa and Asia kind of are grouped together and they have similar fauna now. And South and North America are grouped together because of land bridges, but there's that Atlantic and Pacific that divide them east-west. At this time, the major divide in biogeography was north to south. Um, India near South Africa. So you can see India down there over where Madagascar probably would be. Um, now for the rest of the Cretaceous and much of the uh, Cenozoic, India is going to be racing north, but for that intervening time, it's going to essentially be an island continent, kind of like Australia is now. Um, the Tethys Sea um, is covering most of Europe. The reason for this is that throughout the entire Mesozoic, there was no ice age that we know of. An ice age is just when the Earth has ice caps that don't melt in the summer. So once the ice caps melt fully during any summer, you can say that Earth is no longer in an ice age, which means we are still in an ice age right now. We're not at a glacial maximum. We're actually at a glacial minimum, and we're getting more and more minimum on those glaciation uh, with global warming. However, we are still technically in an ice age. Uh, but at this point, that was not the case, which is why you have what would otherwise be low elevation land in today's sea levels covered in low-lying seas. So it's like the Tethys Sea in Europe. Atlantic Ocean is just starting to open. Asia and North America are connected. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why, even to this day, there are actually some deep connections in the flora and fauna of, say, I think places like China and the United States. So, for instance, um, the water, um, what is it? I can't remember the name of it. But there are giant salamanders in China and the United States. And there are alligators in China and the United States and South America. Or alligatorids, I should say, because the South American ones are actually caimans, but whatever. Uh, it's a different subfamily. But yeah, so this is where some of these ancient connections are established. And you also see it with a lot of other animals like ceratopsians and tyrannosauroids evolving in China, moving into North America. I think we'll get into that more later. Um, the world, however, is cooler and less tropical than the Jurassic. Things have cooled off to, and you will get places where there are things like snow. So in the Jurassic, there probably was no snow anywhere except on top of mountains on earth. And even then probably, you know, you had to go pretty far south or north to get to snow, snow uh, peaked mountains. However, at this point, places like um, Antarctica, Alaska, Siberia, these are places where dinosaurs were getting snowed on. There was snow. And so uh, there were actually animals that had to adapt to cold weather. Now, not nearly as extreme as the weather that we have now in those places, but still they had to adapt to harsh winters. Um, so winter in Alaska during the Cretaceous would probably be more like winter in say like um, Maine than it is like winter in modern Alaska. And if you don't know where Maine is, it's the Northeast coast of the United States. Um, they have pretty harsh uh, winters, but still, you know, it gets very warm in the summer. Uh, however, there would have also been much bigger differences in the day length uh, in Alaska. So Alaska was more or less where it is now in terms of north to south. So you have this weird environment where you have these Arctic locations that have month long nights and lots of snow during the winter, but then have, you know, you can get like 35 degrees Celsius during the summer and, you know, nice humid all day sun. So it would have been a very strange world to be in, I think, in many cases. However, it is also when we start to get a lot of the recognizable things that we take for granted today, like a lot of modern groups of reptiles and mammals start to emerge during the Cretaceous, but we're going to get into that a bit more later. So Peter, could you uh, move the slide ahead, please? All right, Cretaceous flora. Okay, the Cretaceous terrestrial evolution was a radiation of terrestrial fauna in the early Cretaceous, arthropods, mammals, and theropods. It was likely caused by the evolution of flowering plants or angiosperms in the late Jurassic. And here we have Archifructus. Now, today, if you go outside and look at a plant, there is a very high chance that it is a flowering plant. Flowering plants are the dominant flora on land today. In fact, they have even invaded many aquatic environments. So um, like lily pads, those are flowering plants. 
Now, the Cretaceous is where we really start getting this. And Archifructus, as you can see in the lower left, is our first, like, proto-angiosperm. And it has the basic reproductive structures of an angiosperm, but they're not actually put into a flower. They're just separate, um, we call them stamens and, um, I don't remember the other term, but sorry. My, my brain is kind of frazzled tonight, so... Uh, but they're just on the end of stems. And it's not clear if they're trying to attract insects or any other purposeful pollinators or not. Maybe they're just doing wind pollination. But this is where we really start getting into what's going to become the dominant flora. And by the end of the Cretaceous, you're starting to really see some of the effects of that takeover. Uh, you want to go ahead and one slide there, Peter? More on angiosperm evolution. Okay, so the male stamen or androsium and the female carpal or yeah, that's the word I was looking for is carpal or uh, gynosium part of the flowers are modified leaves. Petals are two. On the left are three flowers, top to bottom, Australobelia, a primitive angiosperm, magnolia grandiflora, a magnolid, and lilium, a eudicot. Eudicot, there you go. Um, so one of the interesting things is if we think back to Archifructus, which didn't have petals, but it did have leaves, and so petals are in fact modified leaves. And so you're getting the same kind of uh, structures being co-opted for use in reproduction, whereas before they were being used simply for uh, photosynthesis. And this is one of the important things about evolution. Evolution basically never just starts from scratch and creates something new from whole cloth. It adapts previously existing structures for new functions. Uh, so we're going to look at a, the uh, evolution of carpels. So according to one theory, the carpel began as a modified leaf with sporangia. So sporangia are locations where spores are given off. In the course of evolution, the leaf edges curled inward and finally fused. So now you have a tube full of these spores. At the end of the sequence, the carpels have fully formed a, uh, an ovary. So now you have an, an area where seeds or, well, female uh, gametes are concentrated. And then the leaf-like portion of the structure was progressively reduced until only the microsporangia remained. And so now you have this, um, yeah, you're basically, you're, you're taking spores from the edges of leaves, curling that inward, and then getting rid of, rid of the leaf-like elements to get what's basically just a reproductive organ. And why would you do this? Well, you can specialize such structures for reproductive use and make your reproduction much more efficient because you now have something that you can specialize separate from the organs that you're using to just gather food with. Because remember, if you're up at stage one here, up at the top, um, or stage one at the bottom, in both cases, you're trying to do double duty with food production and reproduction on the same organ. You're gonna have to make compromises. You can't get so good at food production or sugar production, you know, in the case of leaves, that it starts to make it hard to reproduce. But neither can you get so good at reproduce, reproducing with these structures that it starts to cause problems for you actually making enough sugar to survive. Because what's the point in trying to get to reproduce if you die before you even get to that point? Uh, whereas flower parts allow plants to do all of those functions really well. And uh, Peter, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Okay, angiospermae. Flowering plants appeared in the early Cretaceous. Fruits and vegetables are seed-bearing structures at the ovary of the flower. Um, one fun thing there is many of the things that you think of as vegetables, like squashes, aubergines, uh, zucchinis, or what do they call zucchinis in, uh, in Europe? I don't remember. Anyway, um, a lot of these things are, in fact, fruit, because Basically, as a rule of thumb, if it's a fleshy covering and it has seeds in there, chances are it's fruit from an angiosperm. Now, as we covered back in the last stream, there are, in fact, fleshy coverings for seeds of other organisms that aren't angiosperms. Angiosperms don't have a monopoly on the idea of covering seeds in protective flesh, but whatever. So um, angiosperms spend almost their entire life cycle as diploid. And you can see that even though there are a lot of steps over here on the haploid stage, most of those are basically small single cells that then go out and germinate. So here you have meiosis resulting in the ovaries and the um, sporangia up the top or top middle. And so then the ovaries produce these basic spores, which are essentially seeds that are then fertilized. 
by the angiosperm. And then at that point, they will be distributed by some method. It varies from plant to plant, and then it will sprout a new diploid plant. So by the time we get to angiosperms, plants are spending the vast majority of their life cycle as diploid structures. And in that, in this case, they're actually kind of like where you see a lot of animals now. Whereas like say mammals are essentially only uh, haploid as reproductive cells. They don't have any kind of adult life as a haploid organism, generally speaking for mammals. And so at this point, plants are also sort of adapt adopting that strategy as well. Um, so unless Jackson has anything, I think we're good on this slide. I, I was nope, away from the I was away from the microphones. Zucchinis in Europe are called courgettes. Yeah, there you go, courgettes. Oh. I I can't always remain, remember the names of all of my vegetables as they change across oceans. Sorry, guys. I'm a dinosaur, not a chef. Well, brings me back to something earlier. You did ask Jackson why uh, some organisms put on a hat. I, I, I'm still, I'm still wondering why a dinosaur wearing a hat would ask that question. But it might just be me. Oh, look! I can, I know why dinosaurs wear hats. I just don't know why, you know, sea urchins wear hats. Same reason. Just throwing it out. Well, there. the the bit, my reasons do sort of require me to have a brain, whereas you know, echinoderms don't really have a brain, so you know. Okay. Well. Next slide. But uh, yeah, let's. Here we go. Jackson, I'm tired of talking about plants for a little bit. You talk about plants. Okay. Uh, so, uh, when you are eating uh, fruits, that is what the ovary has become. So, uh, and your your uh, your ovules. Or you get pollinated, or, you know, or fertilized. Sorry, via pollen, and then your flower grows into uh, the fruit, and so the the seeds are the zygotes ready to be uh, consumed. Well, if they're if they're big fleshy fruits, are ready to be consumed probably by organisms, and then uh, the organism defecates somewhere else, and then the uh, the, the seeds are planted in the grip, you know, or on top of the ground with some nice manure, some some nutritious uh, dirt, essentially, that they're in. And so um, the earliest, uh, or so the, the origin of angiosperms was probably coincident with the origin of uh, fruit also. I mean, I guess it, depends on what you define as a fruit because like uh uh what are they called uh the like buttercups have fruits quote quote but they're like just these little spiky things and you know i don't even know if they're if anything really eats them like do birds eat them or Probably. insects i'm not entirely sure you know <laughs> um but fruits do attract lots of different organisms whether they be you know megafauna or birds or insects and this helps the plant disperse its seeds elsewhere so they can then you know be fertilized or sorry be uh be well i mean <laughs> you know be uh put down somewhere with fertile germinated yeah fertile dirt and then germinate yeah so. they were already fertilized they now need to germinate yes. in fertilizer fertilized in fertilizer now <laughs> Yes. So. The fertilization that happens with fertilizer is different than the fertilization that happens during reproduction. Yes. Yeah. And so this, this picture here on on the, the right is just showing, like, in an apple specifically, what the different parts of the flower become. So you have your your stem, and then uh, yeah, your ovary and accessory tissues, and then your sepals at the top, which are on, on the bottom, quote, quote, of the apple. Those Apples little... are just tree eggs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, interestingly, before some flowers were discovered in the Jurassic, um, it seemed like the first flowers just kind of 
like appeared like you have eudicots and monocots and magnolias sort of all in the early cretaceous and it's like well where'd they come from but as we was talked monocots to... uh well they're actually so monocots and eudicots are sister to each other and then magnolias are basically derived with respect to both are you telling me that there are eudicots and monocots um what did i no you I, said eudicots and i thought it was no monocots. eudicots eudicots oh, okay. e-u-d-i-c-o-t i thought uh, because, i heard eunicots and i was about to write if both monocot and eunicot <laughs> were both things yeah no sorry. that's not a, that's not okay um yeah the then uh eudicot and monocot refers to how many cotyledons which are the embryonic leaves that the plant has the angiosperm has monocot of course has one but there is no dicot clade there is the eudicot clade uh, and then magnolias are basically derived with respect to both and then there are even more basally uh derived flowers that exist today uh so they're called the um the anita grade flowers uh, i think the most basally derived of them is is called the uh, is called amborella and it's it's so primitive that it's uh, it's it's uh, um, the leaves that fuse to become the carpal are not fused all the way. They're like held together with sticky secretions, but they're not fused totally. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what what's what's on the next slide. I don't know. Pite, pite. No. Oh wait. Can you go back? Two maybe. Uh -huh. What's one before this, and then one before that? Oh, it was here. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I put that later. Anyway, uh, so you talked all about the, yeah. Okay, so yeah, that was just what I wanted to show. Um, but yeah, we already did it. So yay, yeah, go team. Yeah, I'm, I, I, this isn't my first rodeo, there, Jackson. Yep. Sorry, I had to step away for a moment. But yes, all good. I forgive all right. you. It's time. Forward we go. And I think again. Yep, that's back to Dapper. Me. All right, sauropsids. Wait, wait, why are we calling this sauropsids? Okay, sauropsida. Oh, whoops. This is, is not like Lepidosauromorpha. I don't know why I put sauropsida there. My bad. Yeah, sauropsida includes dinosaurs along with all of these groups. It, it's it's basically what people think of as reptile reptilia. I don't know um, about that. So this is the, the wrong um, label. However, actually, we could say that we're looking at lizards and perhaps Toxicophora lizards because Toxicophora is a probable clade. Is is what I'm going to go with? A probable clade. Um, and so we have uh, snakes. Jackson tetradof Tetrapodophus isn't even a lizard. You got to get it out of here, man. It's no longer. I said it's. It's I. Well, I said these are uh, Lepidosaur morphs, and Tetrapodophus is, uh, like a a basal uh, mosasaur now. Isn't isn't that mm -hmm. in that group? Isn't it? Not even a lizard anymore. I could have sworn I just saw a paper that came out that was like this is a basal mosasauroid. Oh well, then maybe that other paper that I was thinking of has been uh, countermanded. That could happen. What What did you What What were you talking about? I don't honestly remember the name of the paper, but I thought... I mean, I what was their position for it? Oh, um... I think it was, like, highly derived, um... Uh, what... Uh, Champasaurid. I have not seen that at all for Tetrapodophis. But that is I interesting. I might also be incorrect about what I thought the reassignment was, but I believe that was it. But, hey, you know what? Look, Tetrapodophis or Tetrapodophis, I don't know, is however you say it. It's its name means four-legged snake, and it looks like a four-legged snake. However, whether or not it was is currently contentious. Yeah. Um so with the possible exception of Tetrapodophis, these are all lizards specifically, because the thing is mosasaurs and snakes are lizards. And anyone who tells you differently is a dirty commie. We don't want communist fake lizards or non-lizards uh, contaminating our precious bodily fluids. 
if you get that joke, then you have good taste in, in movies. Um, but yeah, interestingly enough, if you look at the top of the, well, so mosasaurs and snakes are probably sister groups. They're probably very close related, which is also interesting because if you look at the top of the mosasaur line, you get something that basically just looks like a monitor lizard, if you're familiar with those animals. It's like, that's just a monitor lizard, man. Come on. Um, and the thing is, yeah, the most basal um, uh, mosasaurs kind of just look like streamlined monitor lizards. And interestingly, they also look a lot like the earliest snakes. And so there's actually a thought that perhaps snakes actually evolved as aquatic animals. That's not currently uh, well enough established to just say that that's how it happened. But it's an interesting possibility. And uh, we also know that very early on, many snakes did spend, spend a lot of time in the water. And there are still aquatic snakes to this day. Some of the only marine reptiles left are snakes. Um, and so in both cases, both in Mosasauria and in uh, Serpentis, we're getting adaptations to the loss of the use of limbs for propulsion and locomotion. In Mosasaurs, they become sort of flippers that help stabilize the animal while they swim primarily by undulating their spine side to side like most fish. And in snakes, we also get a side to side undulation, but in this case uh, with slithering. Uh, and also interestingly, um, mosasaurs are one of those other groups that converges very heavily on other marine animals. They, the, if you look at the bottom, it looks like a shark or a whale or something. Um, and also interestingly enough, uh, monitor lizards also have forked tongues that they use to taste the air just like snakes do, which is another interesting thing where even today you can still see the sort of vestiges of that lineage. Um, I think that's all I have for this slide, Jackson. You have any? Sounds good to me. All right. Crocodilomorpha. Okay, so remember how I said that uh, Pseudosuchians were sort of relegated to the side? Well, they were. However, they were still doing all sorts of cool stuff. Like we have uh, Arapasuchus, which is, as you can see, a very terrestrial, fast-moving land predator. We have Armadillosuchus, which, as the name implies, is the armadillo crocodile, so-called because it is, in fact, a, a terrestrial herbivore that covered itself in thick armor. We have Sarcosuchus, the flesh crocodile that was basically big enough to prey on most macrofaunal dinosaurs. We're talking like big boys getting taken down. Like this is the kind of thing that something the size of T-Rex would still have to be wary about. This is a gigantic animal here. Um, Camarasuchus, we're getting a, actually, I don't know a whole lot about Camarasuchus. Jackson, what do you got on that? I believe that was one of the omnivorous South American crocodilian crocodiles. Ah, there you go. Because South America had some strange guys going on there. South America still had some strange guys going on there. Uh, facts. Absolute facts. Yeah. It's just a weird place. Um, so yeah, I think uh, unless we have anything, unfortunately, basically all of these guys, except the actual um, crocodile line guys like Sarcosuchus are just gone. I would love for there to be like a Cenozoic Phenosuchian, but even the Cenozoic terrestrial crocodilians were actually crocodilians and not like Phenosuchians. Although, Technically, it looks like uh, Spinosuki is actually the ancestral clade to which Crocodilia belong. So technically, Crocodilians are actually Spinosukians, but you know what I mean. Spinosukian grade Crocodilians or Crocodilomorphs. Anyway, let's get the next slide before I start going into weird places with morphology and cladistics. Pterosauria. Okay, so we saw the introduction of the pterosaurs back in the uh, Jurassic, where they were primarily small animals. Uh, a lot of them were insectivores or piscivores, but now uh, the smaller forms of uh, pterosaurs, as well as the long tailed forms of pterosaurs, are basically gone. And they are replaced by the gigantic uh, later or was it, uh, monofenestrin pterosaurs. So, monofenestrin means that the nares and the antorbital fenestra are both joined into a single opening. And you can see this very easily with the uh, Tupuhara skull. Uh, so, but I mean, the top of our skull is also a pretty obvious one. So in both cases, you can see that there's this one big opening in front of the eye, and it goes all the way forward to basically like the, the uh, premaxilla. That is a combination of the antorbital fenestra, which is common to all archosaurs, 
and an Aries, and it has a, a weight reduction uh, mechanism. Because one of the things that's interesting about pterosaurs is that in many cases, as you can see here, their skulls were longer than their torsos, which is bizarre. We don't have any animals, anything like that today. Um, which also meant that their skulls were potentially one of the heaviest things in their bodies. And so there are a lot of adaptations to making sure that this does not become a problem for these animals who have a premium on mass. Mass is their most restrictive like body element because they have to get off the ground. Because even that uh, Hathacopteryx that you're seeing, where it's basically the size of a giraffe, was still flying. And we can tell because it still has a very heavily muscled um, pectoral girdle. So, um, yeah, but the Jurassic, or sorry, the Cretaceous is also a period of declining uh, pterosaur diversity overall. Pterosaurs were not doing well in terms of diversity by the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, and even if there hadn't been, you know, the impactor that ended the Cretaceous once and for all, it's not clear that we would still have pterosaurs. They looked like they were doing pretty poorly uh, in most cases. However, they were doing really well in the giant flyer niches. So, I mean, maybe we'd, we would still have some. Uh, but let's go on to the next slide. Titanosauria. So here's where we're getting some of our last most derived and also, oddly enough, very armored sauropods. Uh, the only macronarians that survived the Cretaceous, as Jackson pointed out. And here's one of the weird things about them, though. These are some of the biggest animals to have ever lived on land. Probably the biggest. So why they need armor? What were they protecting themselves from? And the answer, it, there don't seem to have been a whole lot of predators that would have been able to take down a full-grown titanosaur. But maybe it's that they were they needed the armor as juveniles, and then there was really no big selection pressure to get rid of it once they grew up. That's one possibility. Uh, could have also been for uh, display or intraspecific combat. Of course, display is also one of those things that biologists say, like whenever they're not sure what to do, what else to say. That's yeah, it's just display structure. Sometimes they're right, but um, yeah, this is where we get Argentinosaurus, Saltosaurus, Magusaurus. We also get things like Dreadnotus, uh, Titanosaurus, Alamosaurus, which despite being from Texas is not named for the Alamo, which is baffling to me, but whatever. Secretly, I think it might have been and that the authors actually just made up a different story for the etymology section on the paper describing Alamosaurus, but you know, whatever. Um. So let's do the next slide. Actually, I think this is probably a good spot to call it. Okay, well, in that case. So, and then uh, we'll end the Mesozoic next time and start the Cenozoic. Cenozoic? Yeah, I don't know. The age what? of mammals. <laughs> like mammals need to, need or deserve their own age. I mean, you you may have been hiding out this whole time, but like the mammals have sort of taken over. Um, there's still a whole lot of dinosaur diversity out there. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I mean, I don't see very many um, theropods running, you know, ecosystems nowadays, except in like. Uh, have you met uh, the shoe build few stork? places? I mean, I said very many. That's that's one example. So, uh, look, I live in a place where some of the top predators are, in fact, still dinosaurs. So I don't know what you're talking about. And, and <laughs> I'm going to be 60 in two days, so I'm all for mammals not having age at all. <laughs> well, happy early birthday! <laughs> happy birthday! Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So, Jackson, what what else is coming up? What, what can people look forward to? On here, uh, I'm thinking about doing a series on a an, a creationist book I got that was written in, that was published in 1967. So that is something. And then, of course, if, if you want to come back and do that, you, you can. I'm not going to make you be here for that. Uh, but if you want to do that, uh, it's fine. Um, that's really about it. I know the semester's about over. This next week is the last one. So in theory, I should be able to get back to other content in addition to this. So we'll nice. see, I guess. Yeah. What about you? What's going on on your channel, Dapper? So let's see. Um, tomorrow, I'm probably going to mirror the our third section of uh, our evolution, the process of evolution, evolution 101, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. 
That's going to be uh, Saturday. Uh, let's see. Tuesday will be Kent with Bent, some number, some high number, <laughs> um, which is where I drink alcohol and uh, debunk and or laugh at Kent Hovind. That's also a lot of fun. Um, you know, as long as your liver is up for it, which it's it's basically become the one day that I drink now. <laughs> it's Tuesdays. You just get all of it in on the one day. You don't need to do the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, every great once in a great while, I'll go buy something for like a, a drink on the weekend or something. But like, it's basically now just, just Tuesdays. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I consider it a work expense. The alcohol basically yeah um so that's the third on the fourth on my off topic channel top hats off episode two of power rangers jungle beasts an actual play for the power rangers rpg published by uh renegade studios sorry renegade game studios um it is entitled mapinguri uh it will also hopefully be the introduction of the yellow ranger who was not in our first episode. So we will be growing the team from four to five Rangers. Um, I think it'll be a fun time. So that'll be the fourth. The fifth should be the next and second, the final episode about Kurt Wise telling people how they're cowards for not thinking that pronghorn aren't deer. Like it's, it's a really weird video. I, I don't fully understand why he thought that any of this was a good idea to say or do, but he did. And now I'm going to talk about it. Um, and then the Saturday after that, I have no idea what's coming on. And that's about as far ahead as I want to look right now. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right. Well, on that note, uh, I guess I'd like to say, well, thank you for coming, Dapper, as usual. Uh, thank you for hosting, Peter. And thank you, everybody in the side chat, for watching. We always appreciate it. So uh, have a nice night, and we'll see, or morning, or afternoon, whatever time it is where you are, you time travel. Have a evening. nice period of time. Yes, indeed. So uh, we'll see you all next time.